Hi everyone, I'm Jeremy Dickinson. I thank you all for watching and welcome to my YouTube channel, Philosophy Clips. In this philosophy clip, I'd like to continue my discussion of Judith Jarvis Thompson's classic and landmark 1971 essay, A Defense of Abortion. And in this third and final part, I'll be discussing Thompson's argument for the pro-choice position. So in order to do that, I'll be talking about what I call the voluntariness view, and it's Thompson's response to this view that generates her argument for the pro-choice position. So in the first two parts of my video series here on Thompson, I've spent quite a bit of time talking about those radical and extreme pro-life views. And so everything really up to this point in the Thompson's compatible with having a moderate pro-life position. So it's not until she responds to the voluntariness view, again, as I call it, that Thompson hasn't argued for or developed the pro-choice position. She's working her way towards that. She eventually gets there. Whether or not she succeeds, that's not up for us to determine in these videos, but uh, hopefully you see the line of argumentation and how it's proceeding. So she first responded to the radical view, as we call it. She was she responding to those who would want to claim that abortion is impermissible, even in cases where a female has been raped. And then she responds to the extreme views, which would have it that it's impermissible for a female to have an abortion in cases where the fetus is compromising the life, the very life of the female. We've seen Thompson's responses in part one and two. If you need to catch up to speed, I really encourage that you watch both of those parts. But before diving into the voluntariness view and Thompson's response to it, what I want to do is follow Thompson here a little bit because she does some really interesting work in helping us understand, at least a bit better, what it means to have the right to life and what it means to have the right to use another's body. My immediate reflection on the abortion debate would tell you that these are very important rights to have an, have an understanding of. And what Thompson wants to argue is that many philosophers in thinking about the abortion debate haven't thought carefully enough about these rights. So she does some of the important work for them. Now let's follow her discussion here. So let's begin with the right to life, her discussion of the right to life, and then we'll turn to her discussion of the right to, to the use of another's body. Much of what she says about the right to life, we probably already have an intuitive understanding of based on her earlier discussions, based on her discussion of the radical view and the extreme view. But here she just gives it a bit more of a rigorous voice. As you know, Thompson loves to generate cases imaginative cases in order to um, develop and illuminate her points. So she'll do so here again. So here's um, what someone might think uh, initially in thinking about having the right to life. One might think that the right to life involves or entails having the right to the bare minimum to keep themselves alive. Again, one might think that one that one's having the right to life entails having the the right to the bare minimum to keep oneself alive. Thompson wants to argue, though, that this entailment doesn't hold. Why not? Well, again, she likes to run thought experiments, counterexamples, and the counterexample is going to be to this entailment claim. She has us imagine herself in a hospital bed. She's about to die. The bare minimum to keep herself alive is going to be the cool hand of Henry Fonda on her fevered brow. So Henry Fonda, if you don't know, is a famous actor from Thompson's Day, you know, back in the 70s. Pick your favorite um, actor or actress now, if you'd like. Um, some heartthrob type figure. Does Thompson have a right to Henry Fonda's cool hand on her fevered brow to keep herself alive? The answer is no. So the right to life doesn't entail having the right to the bare minimum to keep oneself alive. Thompson's going to go on to say, we already knew this based on um, the violinist case. Remember, there's a violinist. The violinist needs as a bare minimum to stay alive the use of your kidney. The violinist does not have the right to the use of your kidney, um, at least if you haven't consented to in advance, etc., etc., etc. So it looks like, just given the, like, the original violinist case, we already knew that having the right to life doesn't entail having the right to the bare minimum to keep oneself alive. But what about the following? What if um, one thought that the right to life entailed having the right not to be killed by anyone? Maybe this is a bit better than the previous one. Uh, maybe not, Thompson says, because think about the violinist case again. If you unplug from the violinist, you do something that's on a par, she says, with killing the violinist. So the violinist has the right to life, but doesn't follow from that right that the violinist um, has a right not to be killed by you, by your unplugging, for example. 
So that's not going to be a good enough even quasi-analysis for thinking about the right to life. So then she turns to the following um, entailment claim involving the right to life. Having the right to life entails having the right not to be killed unjustly. And here she ends up saying, hmm, seems like we can settle for this one, but we might need to unpack it a bit. So she unpacks it to mean something like the following. Um, having the right to life entails having the right not to be deprived of the things to which one has a right to for continued existence. So it's not just having the right not to be deprived of the things to which one um, needs for continued existence. It's having a right to those things that one needs for their continued existence. You have to have a right to those things that one needs for continued existence. So again, let's just make sure we're really clear here. Um, so having the right to life, Thompson claims, does entail, it seems, having the right not to be killed unjustly. But what it means to have the right not to be killed unjustly means having the right not to be deprived of the things to which one has a right to for continued existence. So then when we think about this right to life and we think about the fetus and the fetus having a right to life, then the fetus has a right to life. And that means that the fetus has a right not to be deprived of the things to which it has a right to for continued existence. Now, of course, we know that fetuses require, at least in many cases, most cases, the female's body for an extended period of time before the fetus becomes viable, of course, for continued existence. But now the question is, does the fetus have a right to the use of the female's body, that which is needed for continued existence? So you see how the right to life discussion segues naturally thinking about the abortion debate to the right to the use of another's body. Does the fetus have the right to the, to the use of the female's body? If the fetus does have that right, then, um, then the fetus is right to life, which entails having the right not to be deprived of the things to which one has a right to, to, to for continued existence. Right? That would mean that all things being equal, um, the fetus's right to life would be violated if the female were to have an abortion. Okay, so let's turn our attention to having the right to use another's body. And what Thompson wants to say is that having the right to use another's body is going to involve the person's body in question being properly consented to. So in the case of, of, of a female getting pregnant and a fetus forming, of course, um, in that case, the fetus is going to have um, the right to use a mother's body if the female has properly consented to using the female's body. So, so once again, um, just, so, just so we're clear here, um, if the female has properly consented to allow the fetus to use her body, then the fetus has a right to use her body. So now, of course, there's going to be hard questions about what it means to properly consent to, uh, to the fetus in these kinds of cases. And this is where the voluntariness view comes in. According to the voluntariness view, the proper consent condition is pretty, is pretty easily satisfied is satisfied by voluntariness. So that's why I call it the voluntariness view. So on this view, if a female engages in voluntary intercourse and she gets pregnant, then proper consent has been established and then the fetus has been given a right to the use of the female's body and there you go. The right to life of the fetus we know does entail having the right to not be deprived of the things to which it has a right to for continued existence. Well, if a fetus has a right to the use of the female's body for continued existence, then it has the right not to be deprived of the female's body. And all things being equal, then abortion would be, would be wrong. So the voluntariness view is going to have it that the proper consent condition has been satisfied. But what Thompson wants to say is that it has not. That's what I want to do. I want to read from Thompson because she's so good. She's so... Um, um, clear in her case presenting. So let me see if I can read from her. So this would be a long quote from the Thompson paper. And here's what she says. She says, for there are cases and cases, and the details make a difference. If the room is stuffy, and I therefore open a window to air it, and a burglar come, comes in, climbs in, excuse me, it would be absurd to say, ah, now he can stay. She's given him a right to the use of her house, for she's partially responsible for his presence there, having voluntarily done what, what enabled him to get in, in full knowledge that there are such things as burglars, and that burglars burgle. Okay, I'll continue. 
it would still be more absurd. It would be still more absurd, excuse me, to say this if I had, had if it had had bars installed outside my windows, if I had had bars installed outside my windows, precisely to prevent burglars from getting in. And a burglar got in only because of a defect in the bars. It remains equally absurd if we imagine it is not a burglar who climbs in, but an innocent person who blunders or falls in. Again, suppose it were like this. People seeds drift about in the air like pollen, and if you open your windows, one may drift in and take root in your carpets or upholstery. You don't want children, so you fix up your windows with fine mesh screens, the very best you can buy. As can happen, however, and on very, very rare occasions does happen, one of the screens is defective, and a seed, drift, and a seed drifts in and takes root. Does a person plant who now develops have a right to the use of your house? Thompson's verdict, surely not. Despite the fact that you voluntarily opened your windows, knowingly kept carpets and upholstered furniture, and you knew that screens were sometimes defective. Someone may argue that you are responsible for its rooting, that it does have a right to your house because after all, you could have lived your life with bare floors and furnitures or with sealed windows and doors." End long quote. Okay, so that's all. There's a, there's a lot that's going on there. So let's see, if, let's see if we can unpack it here a little bit. So again, keep in mind, she's responding to what I call the voluntariness view. And she begins with the case of the burglars, right? So you want to open your windows, and guess what? When you open your window, you've done what's voluntary, right? Knowing that a burglar could enter your home, and a burglar does enter your home. So if that were to happen, then does a burglar have the right to your home? I think your immediate response would be, of course not. You can call the police and have the burglar removed. Perhaps you could try to remove the burglar yourself. Okay, so having done that which is voluntary, namely opening the windows, knowing that a burglar can enter your home, it isn't enough to make you, I don't know, have to live with those consequences, have, make you have to live with the burglar being inside of your home. But we all see what's going on here, don't we? This analogy is to females who would engage in intercourse. So opening the window because it's stuffy amounts to females engaging in intercourse because they want to have intercourse, right? Um, if that were to happen and a fetus were to form, the thought here being like, look, if in the burglar case you'd have the right to remove the burglar, then in this case you'd have the right, the female would have the right to remove the fetus. Because she recognizes that the case isn't perfect because fetuses aren't relevantly like burglars, so she's trying to develop a better case. So she's working her way towards that. And so the next case involves right, an innocent person who stumbles in, right? So you bars are, are put up, right? There's a defect in the bars sometimes, right? An innocent person falls in, or a burglar falls in first, right? And then a, and then a burglar does because she realizes that once again burglar is not relevantly like the fetus. So she changes it to an innocent person because the fetus is more innocent than a burglar. The, the putting up of the bars, right? What does that mean? What's the analogy? Right? The analogy is to right, using contraception. So, so if in a case where um, you put bars up in your home and a burglar makes his way in or an innocent person falls in and happens to make his way into your home, you'd have the right to remove said individuals. And if that's the case, then in a case where a female uses contraception that's reliable but sometimes fails, it looks like abortions would be permissible in those cases because they'd have the right to remove the fetus from their from their wombs. She still recognizes though that look, maybe she hasn't quite got it just right yet, so she moves from um, talking about burglars or innocent people to people seeds. So she thinks that uh, maybe fetuses are more like you know these these seeds that are they're people. They take root in someone's home and then they become you know people plants and. They're there to stay, as it were, unless they're removed. And so this is the famous people seeds case, which generates the people seeds argument, which establishes the pro-choice position that she's been arriving at. So what's the idea here? Well, the people seed um, is able to drift in, even though you put up fine mesh screens in your home, call them Spartans, I don't know. You get these fine mesh screens, the, the people seed makes its way inside your home. You, you knew that by opening the window that you incurred Right, the, um, the the probability that a people seed would float into your home, take root in your upholstery, and might be a person plant, and all the rest. Right. But by knowing these things, by incurring um, 
um, um, the effect of the people seed taking root in your upholstery in your home, have you thereby given the, the people seed, the person plant, the right to the use of your home such that you can't remove it if that were to happen? Thompson says, of course not. You can remove said per, you know, people seed person plant. You can call the relevant authorities or you can uproot the people seed or the person plant and have it, you know, ejected from your home. Likewise, in cases where females engage in voluntary intercourse, they use reliable contraception and they get pregnant anyways, they can, in such cases, have abortions. And what Thompson's thinking here is this. No pro-life individual, no pro-life you is going to countenance permissible cases of abortion in cases where females have abortions for less weighty reasons than the ones we've been talking about earlier, but for reasons like these, reasons involving, I don't want to get pregnant, I tried to avoid getting pregnant, but I got pregnant anyways. Thompson wants to say that these are permissible cases of abortion. She's blown the door open away from those radical pro-life views, the extreme pro-life views. And she's established, she thinks, the pro-choice position because she's established the permissibility of abortion in cases like these, in cases where females, again, voluntarily engage in intercourse and get pregnant anyways. So Thompson thinks that the voluntariness view fails, proper consent hasn't been established in order to give the fetus the right to the use of the female's body, and there you go. The pro-choice position has been, has been established. Now, Thompson doesn't think that um, abortion is always thereby a permissible. She doesn't go radical. I've, I've hinted at this in previous videos. She doesn't go like radical pro-choice on the other end of the spectrum. She thinks that there are cases in which it would be impermissible for a female to have an abortion. She cites one such case. The case that she cites is a case where a female who wants to go on holiday, goes up, wants to go on vacation, she's seven months pregnant. And for that reason, that reason alone, she wants to have an abortion. Thompson says that seems like that'd be impermissible in that kind of case. So she takes it to be a virtue of her view that she makes it generally permissible, but doesn't make it the case that it's always permissible for a female to have an abortion. So she develops a kind of moderate pro-choice position uh, in her paper. Okay, so it's the people seeds argument ultimately that she arrives at. She thinks that that's like the best case. Um, so it's the people sees case that generates the people sees argument. She takes that to be the best case, the best argument to respond to the voluntariness view. And we see the argument generates a pro-choice conclusion, the moderate pro the moderate pro-choice conclusion that she arrives at. Okay, so thank you all for watching, everybody. If you have any questions, please comment below. I'll do my best to answer them um, as best I can. All right, thank you all for watching. Bye-bye.